Music in the Bible. All right, this is part two. You say, why in the world do you do a series on music? You know, first of all, somebody said one time that the two worst things, not worst things, but the two uh, maybe most offensive or controversial things a preacher preaches about is either clothing or music. I think nowadays we've got to add to that animals. <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all get that more than others, but the love of animals is controversial, man. You don't want to offend people, you don't rock the boat or anything like that. But anyway, music is. It's, it, it is. Just, and, uh, and like I said, music, clothing, when you start talking to somebody about that, they're very emotional about it. And they, they, you know, they're attached. This is my philosophy on these things. It's what I like to listen to. It's what I like to wear. And uh, so sometimes whenever you preach on that, it gets real offensive, but really doesn't need to be. I mean, it's just one of those subjects like anything. Where we're, what does the Bible have to say? And I'm going to look and see what the Bible says. It's not an idea of, you know, hey, what can I get by with doing? Or what loopholes can I find in the Bible? It's just what does the Bible say about music? And maybe we'll be correct. Our, our thought would be corrected on some of these things, no matter where we lean on our thoughts regarding uh, uh, music. But music is a very important part of anyone's life to some degree. But particularly, I think the believer... Music is a very uh, uh, important part. We're not going to talk about it tonight, but it's an important part of worship, worshiping God. It's an important part of us learning, memorizing scripture, learning uh, truths from God's word. Music helps us do all those things. Those are two lessons we'll do in the future. But so last week, what I talked about was uh, music as a celebration, right? Music. Uh, is something that's used in all kinds of festivities and just celebrating. And we talked about how primarily I think the main application that was made was uh, in church music. Who is being celebrated? You would think it's church, so we're celebrating God. But if you really think about it, and this is going to bleed in a little bit to today, tonight's sermon, if you really think about it, the focus on a lot of the singing, the modern, you know, particularly contemporary singing, the focus is on self. You know, it's, it's all about pleasing myself, even if it's talking about God saved me and all these wonderful things that we ascribe to God, which is very true, and it's not necessarily a wicked thing to say, but really the song is all about how it affected me and what I'm going to do for the rest of my life and how I'm going to live for Him and all that. And, and again, that's not inherently bad. And, and maybe somebody, you know, listened to the message last week and said, you know, man, I think that was a little extreme because like the words to some of those songs you read at the end, those were pretty good words, I think. And I, I mean, some people might might say that, but the focus I wanted to make was that I don't think that the words to a lot of songs being set, sung today under the umbrella of Christian music is really as God honoring as some people think that it is. And I think we could show that a little bit from the Bible. Uh, but then to, today uh, we can take the same things that I taught last week on those songs and then I can apply this principle, even if. Even if the songs had really good words to it, you know, it could still be uh, not so pleasing in God's eyes. It could still be all about us, even if it's great words. I mean, I've seen them take good songs out of the hymn, hymn book, put it into a modern church, uh, sing it in such a way where I personally don't believe it was honoring to God at all. And so uh, to, tonight's message will deal with that a little bit. And the message, the title of the message is this, Music in the Bible Part 2, and it's Music as a Mood Enhancer. Music as a Mood Enhancer. So if you got a pen, write that in there. Mood Enhancer. Now, I think everybody can understand that. We've all had seen how music can affect us and everything. And, and so the verse that was already read tonight from 1 Samuel 18 talked about it's probably the most popular and the clearest picture of what I'm saying is how music was used to lift somebody's spirits. All right. Uh, David was just simply serving God. He killed a giant. Everybody said, well, he's just a great hero. And, uh, and they ascribed to him ten thousands and Saul got jealous. Now, I don't have time to go into it deeply. I'd like to look into it a little bit more and maybe preach a message someday on that evil spirit from the Lord. That, that phrase is used a lot of times in the Bible. And that evil spirit from the Lord came upon him, and he just had a bad spirit, a bad spirit. And so David would actually play for him on a, a harp. You know, it was a, it's kind of surprising, but a lot of the instruments mentioned in the Bible are instruments that we use today. Just They've taken on different form throughout the years. Uh, but flutes and harps and uh, 
uh, all kinds of things are very similar. He would play on this kind of harp, probably a small harp, just based on archaeology and, and different things. And he would play on that, and it was soothing to Saul. And so he'd be comforted for a little bit. And then I don't know if it was after, you know, David stopped or what the case was, but then Saul would get all of a sudden upset again, and he threw the javelin and tried to kill David. Now look at uh, chapter 19. It says the same thing. Chapter 19, verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin in the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. And I forgot to read verse 9, but it says the same thing once again, uh, that David played with his hand on that harp. And, and, uh, and so we see that that music was somehow instrumental in helping Saul's mood, but did it really last? Did it really work? Obviously not, right? So anyway, so the first point there uh, under A is that music can be used to lift the spirits. We use that all the time. You know, this is something that we would use, that we would do to lift our spirits. This really lifts the spirits, and music can lift the spirits, okay? And I know that spirit there is, uh, there's a lot more that we said about that. But uh, number one, I want to uh, talk about this just for a second. Music is proven to be a stimulant, okay, a stimulant. And uh, really, if you think about I don't want to just jump to drugs, although drugs is something that you can include in this. A stimulant, and I'm thinking like, man, I need to pick me up. So I eat something sweet, have some sugar, have something like that, and it picks you up. Drink me a, a, a coffee or something like that, have some caffeine. You know, we were just visiting uh, today, pretty much all day. We've been at the hospital visiting uh, one of the ladies from Iola Baptist Temple who has had, had brain surgery. And so it's, it's, it's a, you know... I want to say major surgery. Obviously, there's always a little risk involved, but uh, uh, but anyway, she made it through that fine and everything, and uh, and so when I'm at the hospital, I see these uh, doctors who are working these long shifts, no doubt, and they're just downing these energy drinks. Every time you see them walk through, they got energy drinks in their hand, and they're just downing them. I remember when I ran, well, I was I was working at an aid station for a hundred mile race. And this guy, who was actually a doctor too, right? This was just his hobby on the side. And he's running every single aid station. He gets a, a big old uh, energy drink, and he's like, glug, 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 and just down the thing. I'm like, man, I don't know how you can do that. But, uh, but anyway, he just needs the caffeine. I need something to pick me up. I need a stimulant, right? So, it's been proven. You can read a lot of studies out there. Uh, give you all the details and lay it out. That music affects our dopamine levels. All right, dope. What's dopamine? Uh, dopamine is a chemical a reaction that's in the brain, okay, that causes you to feel good. It's a chemical, it's a, it produces a feel-good state in response to certain tangible stimulants, such as being in love, you know, maybe some have never experienced that before, I don't know, <laughs> but some of you uh, know what I'm talking about when you're feeling in love, and I remember whenever I uh, first, I would say, fell in love with Valerie, and I knew she was the one, and I walked around, and just like the cartoons, you know, head above the clouds and stuff like that, and somebody would say something to you, and you just didn't really care. Man, you could do anything to me right now. I don't care. I'm in love, right? And it's those dopamine levels in someone's head. It cause guys to do some stupid things, actually. <laughs> All right, but let me pick on the guys for a second. How about this? Eating chocolate, ladies, produces a chemical reaction causes these dopamine levels to spike, okay? It's a stimulant. I'm just feeling bad. I'm feeling depressed. I need some chocolate. And so they eat the chocolate, and, <laughs> and it helps them feel good, at least for a little bit, right? And music has been proven to create the same response. It'll make you feel good, just like eating chocolate. Here's another one. This is a much healthier, much better one, although I'm not against chocolate. Exercise, okay? Exercise, you say, man, how in the world could anybody feel good after exercise? Well, go try it a few times. <laughs> go uh, start running. You, you'll hate it the first few times, but after a while, the dopamine levels, you actually begin to crave it and you get addicted to it just like you would a drug, uh, just like you would coffee or, or whatever. And you say, man, I got to go out there and get that, you know, feel good. Having a long, hard day and you're like, man, I can't wait. As soon as I get off work, I'm going to go for a run. And, and people think, what in the world? Why would you want to do that? It makes you feel good. You come back, you're like, okay, now what? I throw anything at me. I can handle it, right? I had my run. And then you say, man, you're an addict. Well, that's exactly what happens. You get addicted to uh, this feel and this feel-good uh, stimulant uh, called dopamine. All right, number two there, 
The problem with relying on music to control your emotions, just like relying on any of these other things I mentioned to control your emotions, is that it's very temporary fix. It's a very temporary fix. And so somebody will uh, be fighting depression. Man, I just, I just can't help it. I'm always depressed. I need to listen to my music. Now, here's a strange thing, man, and I'm not going to get into all the, I'm not a scientist or anything like that, but I've known a lot of people in my life that fight depression, and you know, a lot of them listen to heavy metal. And I'm like, what in the world? How do you think that's going to lift your spirits? And I just recently even saw a, uh, a Christian, kind of an uh, online preacher. I don't know to what extent his ministry does, but I know he does a lot of preaching, and he show, shares his videos online and all that. And he recently started doing a, uh, 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 like a review of different Christian metal bands. And he's like listening to it, and I was like, all right, I'm going to listen to one of them just to see. Maybe I got a wrong idea about what Christian metal is, and I don't. It sounds just like heavy metal that the world listens to. It's just got some really, in my opinion, very watered down, shallow Christian words that they throw in there that sound good. But it, and even while he's listening to it, he's doing the same motions like they would do. And I'm thinking, man, it's just, you might think you like it. It might be doing something for your emotions. But here's what I know about the heavy metal. Everybody I've ever known you know, they might listen to that and say, oh, I need to listen to that. It helps me feel good, you know. But here's what always happens. Once they come down from that, they're angry. Every single person I've ever known, you know, they, they would yell at their parents. Whenever I was a kid, I knew some people that listened to heavy metal. they yell at their parents. They'd be angry. They Sometimes they'd go off and, and, and be violent. You know, you find out a lot of these guys that do uh, mass shootings and stuff like that. I know they have all, you can link a whole lot of things to them, but a lot of times they listen to heavy metal uh, and, and just uh, different things that might cause them to do that. But it all has to do, I think, with these relying on, on stimuli, some kind of a substance. They'll listen to the music or they'll take some kind of uh, drug or they'll take a quick fix of uh, energy drink or something. And, that's, and some of those things... I'll say to a degree has their place. I'll, I'll mention a couple of them here in a second. But when you're relying on that and the real source of your uh, stability and your temperance and your reliance on God or whatever, it's got to come from somewhere else. Because if you're going to rely on a quick fix from a, something temporary, you're going to be just like Saul, right? Saul, I need a quick fix. Here, somebody bring in the man with the harp, you know, bring in the dancing ladies, bring in something. I need a quick fix. I need to feel better. Oh, I feel much better. Two minutes later, I mean, throwing a javelin at somebody trying to pin them against the wall. All right. So we got to be real careful. We don't rely on any substance, but music is no difference. And I know a lot of people, they, they addict themselves to music to the point where now I can't do anything without music. All right. So let me give you some examples. Uh, like I already mentioned, fighting depression. Your focus should be on first spiritual growth. You know, why am I depressed? There must be something wrong spiritually. Now, I'm not going to say there's not certain chemical imbalances that cause depression and everything, but you ought to first and foremost say, I'm going to just spend time reading the Bible, praying, trying to fix myself, get my spirit aligned with uh, the Lord and, and just be praying that he'll help me through this and he can give me peace. He's the Prince of Peace and he'll do that. Uh, but then also uh, the second thing I would say, before relying on any other substance would be this, eating healthy. Sometimes our, our nutrition, the balance of our diet is so off balance that it'll actually cause other chemical imbalances that will cause us not to be, uh, not to, you know, maybe always be depressed or always be angry or something like that. I'll tell you this, when I'm on a diet, I've been fortunate last few days, ever since I saw the, the, uh, the first video that was recorded. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this, this thing doesn't hide me very well. <laughs> I saw that picture, I said, that's it, man, I'm going on my diet. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anyway, but I've been fortunate the last few days, I've been feeling pretty good. But uh, And some of that has to do with what foods you choose to eat. You know, when you're just restricting your calories, there's a lot of uh, uh, stuff in there that, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not preaching about diet right now. I don't think that's necessarily an important thing to focus on the whole sermon. But I think that is something that sometimes people will just, I don't understand why I'm mad all the time, why I'm this way and that way. And it could be, hey, just, you know, God gave us certain foods to eat. And, uh, and, and let me just make a comparison real quick. Music. What's that have to do with music? Well, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Like I consider, even though, uh, you know, I might eat a little bit too much portions, might add a little bit too much dessert after my meal. I'm a pretty healthy guy because I, for the most part, eat really healthy things. I love healthy food. I just love desserts too that I add on top of it. But listen to this. Music can be kind of like that too. You don't ever want any music that's sensual 
and I'm going to get into that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But any music, that, I don't mean sensual, like uh, sexually appealing or something like that necessarily. I just mean of the flesh. Like it's all about lifting up your spirits and all that kind of stuff. Anything like that that you're doing that's sensual, it's not really helping you in your walk with Christ. It's not really, it's not nutritious, let's say. Okay, and your diet's the same way. Eat the healthy food, right, because that is what you're going to have to thrive on. Sing the good songs, sing the hymns, sing the psalms, uh, sing good things. And, and, uh, and, and sometimes just, you know, you got to go on a diet. Sometimes don't listen to anything. Just listen to the Lord. And, uh, and so one of the things is uh, what will happen is sometimes people will get so addicted to this feeling depressed that the next time that things don't feel quite right, instead of turning to the Lord, they'll say, i got to have my music. And they'll be putting their music on. And you see teenagers all the time, they can't live without their earbuds in, pumping music, and they just got to have that fix. Well, they've got to have to, at some point in their life, learn how to unplug and say, I need to know what it's like. I heard someone say this, and I like camping. I like the solitude. I like being alone uh, sometimes. And, uh, and no, don't, don't say that I, you know, this has to do with my relationship with my wife or kids. I just like the outdoors. <laughs> I like them too, okay? But, uh, but I do like going into the the outdoors. And uh, I've heard people say this, like there are some people that they can't spend very much time by themselves because like you only have so many thoughts and then all of a sudden like, you know, I'm, I'm running out of things to think about or whatever. And, uh, and, and really, if you think about it, a lot of that has to do, I think, with so much technology and so much just uh, information overload. And then now when you're by yourself, you're just like, I need something. I need my cell phone. I need, you know, I need some information, some overload. And a lot of times, music is one of those things to go to. Just always got background music in the car. Can't even make a trip without turning on the music. And uh, and it's really something that could be a bad thing to your diet. It's like eating all this junk. You know, you got to get some of that out, and you got to rely on the healthy uh, food. Okay, that was all free. That's not in your notes. Number uh, B there. Here's a big thing with me. Uh, I went through a time uh, when I was first running, <laughs> when I was doing a lot of long distance running, where you'd be out there for hours at a time. I had to wake up maybe real early in the morning to get my run done, and I'd be out uh, running, and it's just boring, you know, because you're just, all you got, like I said, is your thoughts. You can listen to your footsteps. You can hear the birds and all that, and sometimes you can get into a uh, a, a place where you long to hear those sounds, just to hear the sounds of nature and whatever. But there are a lot of runners who have to listen to something. Or maybe maybe you don't run, but maybe lifting weights or any kind of exercising. And you've ever tried to go there, you try to listen to classical music, da, da, da. man, you're just not going to last very long. You need something that's going to pump you up, right? You're like, yeah, I go to the gym and listen to my 80s, and my 80s heavy metal. You know, <laughs> That's what a lot of people listen to in the gym. I need that to get me going, right? All right, but so now what happens is you rely on that. Like, I can't get motivated to do anything. I can't get any energy and do anything unless I got my, my music or my, en my energy drink or something to give me, uh, pick me up. And that's all temporary, okay? We got to uh, not rely on that. Here's another thing. Uh, motivation for, uh, let's say, I'm just going to use the word battle, right? That's your blank there. Motivation for battling or fighting or competition, Think about games, football games and all that. There's a lot of music involved. And you got uh, cheerleaders and you got marching bands and you got all this. And have you ever noticed that, you know, when you're in the home team, when you're at home, that's when all the, you know, big music and the big band and all this. And what's it doing, right? It's supposed to be motivating you. You're, you're pumped up. So you rely on that. Now what's going to happen when you're an away team and you go and their, their team's the one that's got all the good music and everything. What, are you going to just give up, right? So you can't, you have to, uh, you have to forget about those being controlled by these outside influences and just do what you're supposed to do. Now look at uh, Joshua chapter 6. Okay, and, uh, you know, if you ever have watched UFC or boxing or anything like that, they use music, right, to, in, to intimidate their opponent. And they use a lot of that. It's, it's, they find it kind of necessary. But really, you know, uh, I find it interesting that when uh, somebody is all in control of their emotions and they're relying on their emotions, and sometimes, you know, it even pushes them to rage or whatever, a lot of times you can actually beat them. If you're a, of a sound mind and you're, you know, you're watching, they're sitting there coming out with all this rage and, ah, and they're coming out fighting, you know, but you're just actually on your guard and you got a sound mind. 
A lot of times you can, kill, especially if they're really angry, if they're really mad at you for something, you're pretty much going to win the fight, right? Because they are not in control of their thoughts. They're just coming at you all, all crazy. Uh, but you need to be in control of your, of your mind and control of your thoughts. Have a sober mind. Okay, so look at Joshua chapter 6. This is a very uh, familiar and popular story here. Uh, Joshua in the battle of Jericho. Look at verse 6 now. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and uh, let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn. You ever heard those, that sound? That's just like this really intimidating, real loud. I mean, I just did it real quiet, but real loud, really intimidating. Right? And, uh, and everybody's like, what's going on? You know? Is the Lord coming back with the trumpet, right? It's, uh, so uh, Joshua the, Nun, uh, the son of Nun, uh, now where was I? Okay, they bear the seven trumpets, ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. Verse 7. And he said unto the people, Pass on, encompass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns uh, passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest and blew with the trumpets, and the rear word came after the ark, and the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua, as, and Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about, about it once. And they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on uh, continually and blew with the trumps. And the armed men went before them, but the rearward came after the ark of the Lord and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Uh, and it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the priest, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And so they did that. And I realized that this was a miracle, but I find it interesting that God said, All right, just use some trumpets. Don't shout, but on the last day when you go around all these times, blow the trumpet, and then they're shouting and all that. And you see this kind of like this intimidation. And all of the uh, uh, war, you know, Bible talks a lot about that and different sounds to battle, and, and there's different things. And so there's sometimes we see that in the Bible. And so uh, your first blank, your first uh, point number two, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, number a, a was that music can be used to lift the spirits. B is this, music can be used to seduce or control others. Seduce or control others. And that might have been a little bit of a stretch, but I think in that case, this music was used as kind of an intimidation and, uh, and, and it might have had an impact on that, okay? But it's also used to control an atmosphere, okay? Used to control an atmosphere. Now, sometimes that atmosphere can be a very festive and happy occasion, and so they want this music to keep you happy and keep you in this mood, or it could be a sad occasion. Okay, look at Luke chapter 7. I think it's also in Matthew and Mark, but uh, we're going to go with Luke's account here. Luke chapter 7, verse 32. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Uh, so Jesus is talking to him, and the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what they, are they like? Verse 32. They are likened to children sitting in the marketplace, and calling one to another, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. So you get this picture of these kids, uh, and they're playing their flute. I think a lot of flutes, if you, if you look into it, there were those double flutes that they play, and, and they would play these flutes, just as happy music, and all the uh, people were just kind of like, yeah, so what? You know? And actually, if you read the context here, he's talking about John the Baptist, and he's saying that the people, you know, John came eating and drinking, and they said he had a devil, 
right? And the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and what do they say? They say that, you know, uh, he's a glutton and a wine bibber, right? So uh, he's using that, and he's saying, hey, you're just like these, these kids that sit in the marketplace, and they're blowing, hey, why don't everybody be happy and dance? And they're all just looking like, you know, why are you so happy? Why don't you play something sad? Don't you know, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really reading into the text, but don't you know things in life aren't so great? There's famine out there and pestilence and all this kind of stuff. So uh, real negative. So they say, okay, well, let's do some mourning. And so they play some real mourning sounds. And everybody says, you know, hey, why are you so, you know, why are you playing such miser- miserable music? Come on. like lift up. And he's saying, you guys just aren't content, right? Which is really, they're reprobates. They, they're implacable and they can't be, uh, they can't be p- appeased. And so he's saying, that's what you're like. You know, nobody can lift your spirits and nobody can get you uh, to do anything. But we see here that music can be, can be used to create a mood and an atmosphere that can actually, should be, I mean, to some degree, is able to control you. Now look at uh, Job chapter 30, verse 31. This is just more, uh, more examples of music kind of creating a sad atmosphere here. Uh, okay, Job, verse 31, I mean, verse th- chapter 30, verse 31. My harp also is turned to mourning and my organ into the voice of them that wept. And so he's talking about this, his emotions and how he was looking for uh, mourning. He wasn't, he w- wasn't able to find happiness. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 35. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. <clears throat> And look at verse 23. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, have, have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in a second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah, and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day. And they made them an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. So there was something, of course, Jeremiah wrote a book called Lamentations under the inspiration of God. And what a lamentation was is actually a time of mourning. It was like a song, an expression of grief, and people even in funerals, right? Nowadays, you go to funerals, a lot of times people are smiling and happy, and they're like getting acquainted with each other. It seems kind of weird sometimes to me. But in a lot of cultures, you wouldn't do that. You go in, and there's like sometimes multiple days of just mourning, and there's sad music, and there's like people reading these sad things, and people crying. Even heard stories of people paying mourners to come in, and their job is to just cry out loud and to get everybody to. It's creating this mood, okay? And music can create a mood. If you don't believe that, uh, look at the next thing. Companies use music to control customers' behavior. All right? They use music to control customers' bra- uh, behavior. In a restaurant, what do they want you to do? I want you to order your food, eat it real quickly, get out of here so that more people can come in and fill your seat, right? So they play music that's like fast. I mean, I know there are some, mus- some restaurants where you pay a lot of money where they have soft music and all that. But most restaurants are like, get in, get out. And so the music is fast tempo, and it's trying to get you in there to eat, and to eat real fast, and to get out. And when you leave, you're like, oh, I'm so full. How did I eat that so fast? And whatever, right? That music actually played a part in that, and you might not even know it, all right? You go to the uh, mall. Look at your next one. Stores in the malls is the opposite, really. I mean, they, I mean, uh, they want, well, that's actually kind of similar. They want you to just uh, impulse buy everything, just splurge. Right? And so they're actually playing music that actually makes you want to go into their store and just buy as much thing. Hey, it just feels good. And I just want to get that. And I just want to. And afterwards, you're like, whoa, why did I buy all that? Spend all that money, right? Believe it or not, the music could have helped to seduce you into doing that. Uh, uh, we see uh, a lot of cases where uh, uh, the opposite department stores, 
bookstores particularly, they have the opposite. They have music that want, they want you to stay in there, right? So you won't just buy one thing and leave. They want you to go check that out for a little while. Hey, maybe I'll buy some more. Or go this. And so their music will try to get you to stay longer. And you don't think that these, they, these guys spend, uh, these, one of the highest paid jobs out there is a job where they study all the a analysis and everything for businesses and help them know how to get more customers and retain them and do all that. And I guarantee you, any mar anyone that takes a marketing class, it's going to talk all about music and how that music actually will control somebody. Uh, and it, some of that has to do with what I talked about earlier with the stimulant uh, of these dopamine levels and all that. And so we see that in the Bible that even these, uh, these things are used from time to time. All right. Now, most of the music in the Bible, I realize, as we're going through the study of music in the Bible, it's going to have to do with worshiping God, because right? most of the Bible is written to, uh, to God's people, and so it's going to be talking about. But man, there are a lot of kind of even secular instances of music in the Bible, like we saw with uh, Saul. You know, That music probably wasn't necessarily Christian music. But it was music that was used to, uh, to kind of raise his spirits, but it didn't last very long. And we see these kids piping, and, and, and we see this idea. We understand that music has a huge uh, effect on our emotions and, and our behavior. Parents use music to control children's behavior. You can study, I mean, there are entire courses you can take in school on how to use music to help children's uh, behavior. And uh, I remember whenever there was, I don't even know if they even still have that, but it's called uh, Baby Einstein. Anybody ever heard of Baby Einstein? And they would put in these, you say, what in the world would a baby want to do? Why would they want to watch that? It's just like, it's a, 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 like maybe a ball just rolls across the screen, right? Maybe there's like a teddy bear or something like that. And all they're doing is they're watching like these little images but then there's also like some classical music or something in the background. And they said that stimulates something in the kids that helps them to uh, uh, maybe, you know, use their brain in a certain way or whatever. They've showed studies where they would in, they'd go into schools and they would play some certain kind of classical music in the background. And the kids, according to some studies, I guess it probably depends on who you listen to, the kids would make uh, higher scores on their test because that music helps stimulate something. And so music uh, really does have an impact on people. It controls them. Uh, it's even been shown, here's your last blank there, uh, it's even been shown to control animal and plant behavior. Now, I don't know. I haven't read all the studies. But somebody tried to, you know, grow these plants in, an, in a greenhouse or something, and they pumped in some classical music, and then they pumped in some, like, heavy metal or something. And, you know, it depends on who you talk to. You want to say, yeah, the heavy metal killed all the plants. I don't know if that's true or not, okay? <laughs> All I know is that the music is shown even to have an effect, they say, on plants. It helps them grow whenever there's music. I don't know, okay? But here's the last thing uh, that I'll mention here is Matthew chapter 6. And there's a lot of other passages that came to mind I want to use, but I'm going to use them on another, in another lesson, so I didn't bring them up to, tonight. But look at Matthew chapter 6. You may already know where I'm going. This idea of music being used to seduce or to control others. It's used, and we if you're a man in here, you know this. I mean, women can be seduced too, but men, uh, music can be used to, in, to uh, seduce you. And to some degree, I think that's what's going on here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Moreover, no, no, where am I at? Here, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, no, what am I talking about? It's got to be, uh, uh, let me see here. This is where uh, Herod, okay, in Herodias. This is what I'm looking for, if somebody can help me out. I'm not sure what I did. Was it, was it maybe Mark? Did, you say, did someone say something? No? Is it Matthew 14? All right, you can change that in your notes there. Sorry about that. So verse 14, I mean, chapter 14, verse 6, thank you. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for his oath's sake, and them which uh, sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given. And he sent 
and uh, beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. Now that's sick and wicked on so many levels, right? His daughter dancing before him, that's kind of messed up, right? And then he's like, oh yeah, because I, you pleased me so much, I'll give you whatever you want. And the fact that somebody would even ask for somebody's head in a charger, that's messed up. And then it's messed up that he said, oh, man, I'm, I'm so sorry that you asked me that. But since everybody was listening, I, I guess I'll go ahead and, and, and allow it to happen. It's just messed up. He was a messed up man in, in so many ways. But, uh, and of course, later on, uh, I find it interesting, Jesus didn't even answer him. You remember that? Herod starts talking to Jesus, and he won't even answer him. He's like... I think really some of that can be tied to this. After he did that, that's it, man. I'm not even answering you anymore. Anyway, so, but how could that happen? I, I suspect to some degree just the use of that music and how that music, can, uh, she was probably moving her body in, in a certain way, and it probably aroused him and caused him to think some thoughts and, and to want some things maybe that, uh, that he shouldn't have wanted. I, I, I don't know that for sure, but here's what I can say. The world knows how to seduce men, right? There's all the marketing campaigns out there. You can go back as far as you want in history of marketing. They all use uh, seductive women to entice men and to get them to do different things. And you say, well, yeah, what's, what does that have to do with music? I'm going to tell you this, and I'm kind of closing here right now. But one of the worst things that happened to, quote, unquote, church music, I believe, is the way that it has been sensualized. The way that music has been used in such a way, and you say, oh, you must be messed up to even think this. I guarantee you it affects guys way more than they want to admit. All right? And it really, I think, to some degree has the opposite. I can't speak for a girl, but I think that a guy, guy's music and the way that a guy sings can be used to seduce a woman in the same way, you know? You don't believe that? How about Michael Bublé? <laughs> Michael Bublé, all the ladies, ah, his voice, and he's just so, you know, it's a, it's a way of seducing. Now, women are seduced in a slightly different way than a man is seduced. But a man, you know, if he hears a woman sing in a certain way, uh, kind of, I don't even want to go into great detail, but there's a certain breathy kind of sensual way that a lady can sing, and it's going to do something for the guy. And guys do the same thing, and it affects the girls. And I'm wondering nowadays if some guys aren't affecting guys that way, right? With the, the type of singing that they're singing, and they sound effeminate. And you wonder, like, what are you trying to, to do? What are you trying to sound like? Well, what is the deal with so many, uh, uh, you follow the stars, the music stars in the pop culture? How many of them are, you know, are like Elton John? You know, how many of them are just reprobate and you just follow those? And so it, 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 somewhere, uh, particularly, and I don't have time to get into it now, but particularly in the, to the charismatic movement, if you follow the or, origins of that and everything, it worked its way into the charismatic movement to where I heard a guy one time, a pre preacher, get up in a charismatic church. And he said, everybody wants to talk about how homosexuality is wrong and all this kind of stuff. But all the churches know that they make the best uh, singers. And you all got them in your, in your uh, churches and they're the ones that are singing and all that kind of stuff. And that's what he was saying. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> not in my church, they're not, right? But he's like saying, like, you know, oh, you know, all these churches. Well, he's talking about churches where they get these, like, you know, popular CCM type guys and they come and you say, no, 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 they're not homosexual. Well, they need to quit acting like they are then when they get up there in the way that they're talking and the way that they're dressed and the way that they're uh, so sensual. You're like, I don't know who you're trying to attract, but you're trying to attract somebody with that sound. All right. So now you take what I t the words to the music that I that I talked about last week. And you say, well, those aren't that bad of words. I mean, those are pretty good words. Now, usually the guys singing it aren't even the ones that wrote the words. All right. But they're just reading these words. Hey, that'll make a nice song. And then they sing those words. And I'm telling you, they could do it with amazing grace out of the hymn book. And they do that. And then they sing it in a seductive way. Now, I've talked to a lot of musicians. And they say, oh, yeah, we know what keys to play and what kind of a key change. And, and you do uh, uh, play in a, a certain key or whatever. And it really gets the emotions going. And it gets people worked up. And it gets them, you know, again, causing those dopamine levels to be triggered. And they go to church and they had an experience. Boy, what an experience I had at church today. Well, what did the preacher talk about? I don't know, but that singing sure was good. Well, what did you sing about? I don't know, but it sounded good. You didn't get anything out of church then, right? 
So I'm not talking about worship right now. We're going to deal with that in another lesson. But the fact is that music has an effect on the emotions. And I'm not saying that there's never a time, like I said, you know, it's not wrong to eat chocolate. It's not wrong, you know, uh, uh, necessarily to uh, go for a run so that you feel better about yourself or whatever. There are some things that are okay. Like you don't have to freak out every time something has a, a beat in the background necessarily. But you have to be extra cautious that the music's not controlling you, right? It's not causing you to think thoughts that you shouldn't be thinking. It's not causing you to want to just rely on that for your emotional fix because it won't last. And it'll be just like Saul, you know. It, it, it got his spirits lifted up for a little bit and then, you know, it wasn't true. It wasn't real. It didn't have substance to it. And so our music, what we listen to at home, really, and what we bring into the church better have substance. It better be something that stimulates the brain in the right way. It brings people closer to God and gets them thinking about that rather than just sensual and dealing with the flesh and the emotions. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for uh, music, as, I, as I've uh, uh, said many times. We, it's such a wonderful gift that you've given to us to be able to uh, uh, understand notes and, and uh, melodies and, and be able to comprehend that. And it's really, it could be very intellectual, Lord. But help us to uh, use it in the right way, to glorify you, to edify one another, and uh, lift us up in the, in the right ways, and not to just make it about celebrating ourselves or, or enhancing our mood and uh, lifting our spirits in the, in the fleshly way. But Lord, I pray you be glorified with what we do with our lives in every aspect, and, uh, and especially uh, in this lesson, we want to think about our music, Lord. We, we pray that you bless the rest of the night. In Jesus' name, amen.